We're not going to do a commissioner good morning, but anyway. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming back this morning. I think we'll all agree it was a, one of the best exposed conferences we've ever had yesterday, and hopefully we're going to continue that. I do want to thank several of our partner companies for their support. Uh, thanks to Silver Partners, Kemper Preferred, and QBE for sponsoring the registration this morning, and Presidential Partner Smart Choice for sponsoring the breakfast, and also a special thanks to our Presidential Partner, uh, Jackson Sumner Associates for uh, providing a newspaper and bottled water throughout this conference, and as well as you all see all this production equipment. Uh, they're going to make this video available on their website in a couple weeks, so if uh, you want to have any of your staff or, or you just want to relive the memories, you'll be able to watch it in a couple weeks. Bef before I introduce our first speaker, I want to recognize some special guests with us, and I, and I ask them to stand. Uh, we're fortunate, and uh, this is one of my favorite things as being the chairman is getting to meet some of these young people. But we have uh, some of our future agents and company folks with us. With the students from Appalachian State, please stand. Hopefully they're here. If they, we got a couple. <clears throat> we'll put you in for extra credit for making them meeting this morning. How about East Carolina? All right. And how about uh, UNC Charlotte? I think I saw somebody come in. Here they come. Here they come. All right. I hope if you all get an opportunity to speak with these young folks, uh, kind of get you reinvigorated. Now, I'd like for you to uh, meet the board members that are in attendance. I hope they're here. <laughs> uh, Chairman-elect Bobby Salmon. I'll just call the names. Uh, Secretary Scott Evans. Just stand, guys. Uh, Treasury uh, Jim Mazingo, our State National Director Dow Snipes, uh, immediate past chair, or Tim can't be here, uh, D District 1 Bill Vogides, Robbie Jones, District 2, District 3 Ralph Whitehurst, District 4 Jeff Thomas, and District 5 Wilma Clayton, District 6 Mark, 6 Mark Rice, District 7 Walt Rouse, Jeff Haney, District 8, uh, Dan Gilbert, District 10, Directors at Large, Judy Clemens and Rick Heckel. Thank you. And, and now I wish to bring up our first speaker, Mr. Jerry Reinhardt, uh, says here he's an expert on the Affordable Care Act. So that should be interesting. Uh, he's going to give us the latest update on health care reform and how it will really affect us and our clients. I think if any of you all have anything to do with the uh, health insurance, you'll find this very interesting. Jerry serves on the national faculty of the Society of Certified Insurance Counselors. Um, he's faculty of Florida Insurance School, faculty in the fa no, Florida Insurance School. Uh, he's director and former president of Tallahassee chapter of CLU and CHFC, and uh, past national board of Society of Certified Insurance Counselors. Since 1985, he's conducted over 1,200 classroom convention and webinar programs around the country on topics ranging from life insurance, disability, estate planning, long-term care, business life insurance, and health insurance. Uh, please welcome Jerry Reinhardt. Thank you much. About Ten minutes before we end, if you'll just hold up some fingers. Okay, thank you. Well, there is no such thing as an expert on the uh, Affordable Care Act, okay? Would we all agree with that? Why there's no expert is there's things always changing. And I have a number of places and sources where I uh, try to keep up to date on this, but it is a daunting task because when the law was signed back in uh, 2010, it contained 2,409 pages. In that 2,409 pages, numerous times did it say, to be determined. And now then we've had all sorts of things that are being determined. So what I'm going to do is go through, let's see if this might be a little high here from a st sound standpoint. Does it sound okay? It's okay? Uh, the sound guy says it's good. I am going to go through, and you've, uh, uh, many of you might have the handout there. Is the, is the handout been uh, passed out to folks? Okay. 
I, uh, I know we had them around somewhere. Anyway, uh, what I've got is uh, a bunch of slides, PowerPoint slides, and I'm going to be going through these. I've got a number of uh, comments about them as well as areas of uh, uh, websites that would be beneficial from a standpoint of research. So let me kind of talk about where we're going to go, and we've got both screens here, and I'll be using my uh, uh, laser pointer to discuss some of these areas. There's a number of terms that are associated with this law, this act, that are a little bit inherent to uh, things specific here, so we'll discuss a little bit on this. We'll talk about uh, the, uh, some changes that's taken place uh, since the implementation of this law in 2010. Most of us pretty well know that the act itself is a 10-year timeline. So if we think about this wall over here being March 2010, this wall being January the 1st, 2020, we have about 93 provisions that's going to be enacted in that 10 year. The big year is what year? 14. Uh, just, what, under 10 months away. And uh, since we've had the Supreme Court ruling uh, last June and we've had the presidential uh, election in November, folks, this is it. This is what we've got. So we need to understand it and manage it. I think you in the insurance industry, whether you are really active in the cell or working with clients on health insurance, this is an area you need to have at least a cursory knowledge. A lot of business owners, uh, even HR people, uh, attorneys, CPAs, they're still struggling to find out what this all means. And so if you have at least a working knowledge on this, uh, it would be very beneficial to, to give them a little guidance. Now, I'm going to take about 90 minutes to go through this. It's going to be nonstop. Probably don't have time for questions. Uh, because if we start getting into questions, I won't be get, getting finished with everything I need to cover. Uh, I will be around. Uh, then this after, uh, Later this morning, we have the, the panel. That'd be the great time for question. I know Vince uh, has got the, you know, got the, uh, the program in early, uh, early April that's going to be an in-depth on this, and so I'll be back up here uh, in, in early April. So we'll talk about the implementation, uh, how it worked. We'll talk about penalties. Now, let me just go ahead and mention this. The law does not say an employer must provide health insurance. It doesn't say that. It says you and I must buy a health insurance. Now, what are we going to be buying? I'd like for you to put three letters in descending order. Now, you hear me talk a lot about QHPs. That stands for Qualified Health Plan. Now, my property and casualty agent, we have a ISO form, whether it's a homeowner's or an auto or GL or whatever. So if I buy an ISO homeowner's here in North Carolina and I have the same policy form in Florida, is that form identical in the two states? And the answer is yes. The only thing that's going to vary is going to be the state mandatory endorsements. So we have a standardized homeowner's or, or an ISO form. Today, in 13, we do not have a standardized health insurance policy. 14, we will. We're going to call it a QHP. So you and I will have to buy a QHP if we don't we're going to be looking at a non-compliance penalty. There are exceptions to that, and I'll go through that. What about employers? Okay. <clears throat> now, if you're a large employer, you may be looking at a penalty. I'll define that as I go. If you're under the large, which is going to be 50 full-time employees, you have zero chance of a penalty in 14. Number six there, we're going to talk about coverage requirements. So this is where I'm going to get into the ISO type of uh, verbiage, so to speak, in your health insurance contracts. We'll be talking about your mandates, and this was what the big lawsuit that the Supreme Court ruled five to four was legal. So the Congress and the law can require you to buy a QHP. That was what the big lawsuit was over. We'll talk about plan options as well as who is required as who as well as exempt. We'll talk about various fees, and we have uh, 21 major taxes and fees, and I'll go ahead and tell you in the 2,409 pages, the word tax or taxes is not there. They don't call it taxes, and I'll show you what they do call it when we get in there uh, in about uh, 40 minutes from now. So we'll talk about where this money is coming from and what it's going to be for. Now, what is the, all the taxes and fees going to be for? We have 30 to 35 million people that have no insurance or have insurance that is unaffordable. We are going to make certain these people have insurance or have or at least affordable insurance. And so we've got a lot of fees and taxes, the pharmaceuticals, the uh, insurance carriers, Large employers, people that don't buy insurance because of a non-compliance penalty, they're the ones going to be hit. Now, please note the disclaimer, I am not an attorney, even though I will be talking about a few legal things. I am not an accountant, certainly be talking about a few tax things. I like to refer to myself as a recovering property and casualty agent, okay? 
I owned a PNC agency for a number of years and started moving many years ago into the life area and the speaking and stuff of this nature. So uh, make sure if you have specific things, you would want to talk to a specialist in that area. As I said, the law was signed then. Now, one of the very best sites to come out very early was the White House site or the government site, healthcare.gov. This is what it looks like. Uh, you can go there and understand the law, and it talks in there a couple of places that, uh, you know, to read the law. Folks, I can go ahead and tell you, the law is unreadable. Did the men and women in Congress, did they read it? The answer is resounding, no. no. <clears throat> the law was written by lawyers for lawyers, which means it's unreadable for most of us, okay? So we have to find places where we can comprehend what it says and what it means in that situation. And so other sites that I have found have been very beneficial, NAU, but that's primarily the, the open source side is for its members, the National Association of Under, uh, Health Underwriters. This one is by far your best. I highly recommend you go and spend some time on Kaiser. Kaiser Foundation site is wonderful, easily searchable. They keep it up to date very, very good. Aetna, a little late to the game on some of its stuff, but it is also an excellent site, and you'll see some of the slides talk about those. Now, we have 93 major provisions that's going to be enacted over the next 10 years. They are going to affect every phase of mine and your life. Every U.S. citizen, with minute exceptions, will be required to comply, otherwise it's a penalty. Now, it is, a, is it a felony or a misdemeanor? No, it's not. It is simply a financial penalty if you do not comply. Health insurance coverage, as I said, we have mandated coverages. Health insurance companies and pharmaceuticals, we're going to have a lot a lot of fees and taxes. Now let me ask you, when uh, the pharmaceuticals get hit with a bunch of fees and bunch of taxes, or, and they sell Lipitor for this, are they going to keep the price of Lipitor the same, or what's going to happen to Lipitor? What, what about health insurance uh, premiums? We know, okay. Now a lot of people will quickly point out that the pharmaceuticals and the health insurance carriers will greatly benefit from this. And I understand the argument there, so that's primary, primarily the rationale uh, for the taxes and fees. Uh, employers, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, nothing has been cut in Medicare at this point. Down the road, maybe. Now, I didn't say about the physicians. Are the physicians happy about this? No, they're seeing some reductions in some of the fees, and they just passed a thing called the doc fix uh, digital extension, but it's only for two years. And I can assure you, if you've got some medical personnel in your uh, extended family, you've heard them talking about this. We'll spend a little time talking about some of the 21 major taxes, uh, substantial regulations for hospitals uh, and physicians. You're going to see the physicians probably more and more going to the, like the iPad or something like this when they're uh, uh, getting with you. How many have seen when you went into your doctor, they're now using that? And there's a major reason for that. They have to do things electronic now. And the hospital is the same way. I was doing a program last week, or last Monday, in Joplin, Missouri. <clears throat> and uh, one of the hospital administrators was talking about just for the compliance that the Freeman Hospital in Joplin, Missouri has done already, they have spent between 14 and $15 million for the compliance on electronic records in this law. So it is impacting everything you and I come in contact with, even McDonald's. You go to McDonald's or Burger King, have you noticed that they have the posted on the wall the nutritional content of the Big Mac? You know why they do that? It's not because they're nice guys, it's because the law says they have to. You're going to see this starting this year in your grocery stores, the same thing. Will this have a slight impact on all the fees of everything that we come in contact with? The answer is certainly yes. Now here's the Kaiser site, so you can go and visit that. Uh, I'd recommend you start at the basics. When you go to the basics and you click on that, one of the things that I really like is all the things that it drops down. And one of them right there is illustrating health reform. When you click on that, you're going to bring up a map of the U.S. This is a great little interactive site. Uh, this is a very wealthy husband and wife physician group. This is a university. This one is an average American couple making 110000 a Santos couple. I think this lady here, she is uh, uninsured, got pre-existing conditions. Probably a description of every one of you and I, individuals, individuals or of businesses. And so you click on that. So if you click on like the Santos family, you bring them up, it gives a little snapshot. It tells about them, but then it tells how ACA, the Affordable Care Act, how it will impact them. So it's a very good little learning tool in that situation. Then you go and you click on the timeline. This is excellent from a standpoint of understanding what has taken place. 
what has already taken place, what will be taking place. As I said, we've got 93 provisions. As you can see, in 2010, we already had 26 enacted. Here we are in 2014 at the bottom, and we've got uh, 16 that are coming into effect this year. Uh, I did this slide maybe uh, 14 days or so ago, so at that point in time, we'd had two come into play. When you click on the little plus button to the right of 2014, it opens up a little verbiage on each one of the 16. Then you click on each one of those and it gets more in depth. What I want to do is introduce you to a major thing to understand about the ACA in regards to coverages and subsidies. Look at what I've got highlighted here. And we'll just kind of read this a little bit because <clears throat> it's going to make a lot of sense as I go through this over the next uh, 70, 80 minutes or so. All right, health insurance premiums. If you've got the handout, put a number one right there by premiums. Everybody knows all about premiums. And then put a number two by cost share and subsidies. We're talking deductibles. We're talking copays. Uh, do we have any more of the handouts? Are we getting some more? Okay. Okay. Uh, so we've got two things we're going to talk about here. We're talking about premiums and cost share and subsidies. We're talking about Deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, we all know about out-of-pockets. Look what it says. It says provides refundable and advanceable tax credits and, and cost share and subsidies to eligible participants. And then it says premium subsidies. Now, this is help with your premium. That's what it means in plain language. <clears throat> help with your premium will be available to families as well as incomes if their income is between, and you see a number there, 133 to 400%, and I want you then to write down three letters in descending order because I'm going to tell you what it says, then I'm not going to say it anymore. I'll use its letters for now. Federal poverty level, FPL. If your income is below 400% FPL, you're eligible for a subsidy or help with your premiums. Then, as you can see at the very end, you see the number 250%. 250%. If your income is below 250 FPL, in addition to help with your premiums, you are now eligible for help with your out-of-pockets. Now, you say, where's all this help coming from? Remember the 21 taxes? It's going to come into the coffers of the ACA to help people whose income is lower. And you'll see how this goes as we go. Now, you see the logos, and you go to the, look at that, check out the logos, what it means there. This will be a good little overview to understand how the law works in that area. Now, I want to introduce you to some key terms, and this is just a few of the terms that are associated with this. This first one has impacted every one of you that sell health insurance. Raise your hand if you sell individual or group health insurance. And I guarantee you, you already know this, this, uh, this term. Medical loss ratio. Now, a medical loss ratio, tear me off one of those little uh, pieces of paper there like you're writing on. I want to use, I want to use a, an example of something here. All right. We're going to use an example of this being a dollar bill, okay? You see it says they're 80 or 85 percent. So what is saying that the insurance carriers now that write, oh, let's say with XYZ Insurance Company here in the state of North Carolina, if they have a Form 5000 that they write on groups, they have to, for the entire state, have to spend 80 cents of that dollar on, write this down, QMEs. Qualified medical expenses as defined by IRS. Your surgeries, your office visits, your eye exams, and various all these qualified medical expenses. The carrier has got to spend 80 cents. You guys getting paid commissions, it's coming from here, not from here. That's why you've seen your commissions cut. How many raise your hand if you've seen a little adjustment with your commissions? That's exactly why. Now, what if we have a carrier that spends 75 cents on QMEs and I have a nickel left over. In the past, what have they done with this nickel? They put it in back reserves or they maybe gave it to you if you invested in a company with maybe some dividends. Now, what do we have to do with this? Well, <clears throat> we got to give it back to the individual or entity that paid the claim because what it said, as the NAIC pointed out, if we looked at total premiums received by the insurer minus certain uh, uh, taxes and fees, so let's say you're paying $400 a month for your individual. So you're paying $4,800 for the year. If the carrier had an MLR of 77%, they would have to give you back that $144. How many of you got the letter from your carrier last August or so? It says you're not eligible to receive. Anybody get a letter? How many of you got a check? Okay. Nobody got a check? Okay. We got a few of you got a check. That's what we're talking about right there. So the first round of rebates started in August of last year in that situation. 
All right, note, MLR does not apply to ERISA plans, either fully or partially self-funded. So there may be some avenues for, to look at uh, some of these uh, partially self-funded or fully self-funded plans down the road. Next term, FPL. Talked about that. Now, notice what we're talking about. We're talking about the box one on your employee's W-2. That's what we're talking about. And the federal poverty level. Remember, if your income is below a certain dollar amount, you're eligible for one, help with your premiums. And if it's low enough, now then, in addition, you're eligible for help with your out-of-pockets. What is the number? And you can go, obviously, there's a number of places uh, on the uh, Google where you can search. You can just type in federal poverty level 2013, and you can find all sorts of sources there. But if your income, if you're a family of four, you say, are you kidding me, 92,200? A family of four, if you're below that, you are eligible. Now, I've stressed eligible three or four times. It does not mean you're guaranteed to get a subsidy. And you know, I'll talk about the exceptions as we, as we go over the next uh, the time frame. And you can see for a single. Now, when you get to 133 FPL, guess what your premium is basically going to be for your health insurance? Pretty close to zero, folks. If you get to 100% FPL, I guarantee you your premium is zero because where will your coverage now be? Medicaid. And the lower your income into Medicaid, the less you're out of pocket. And eventually when you're at 100% FPL, you have no, no out of pocket for premium. You have no out of pocket for your uh, cost sharing subsidies that situation. The average or median income around the country, 2010, just under $50,000. Full-time employee, this is very important for you to understand. <clears throat> Notice what it says. This applies only to ACA. It has nothing to do with anything else. I guarantee you, some of you in here, you, you, have, a, you have a thing that says, look, you work for us full-time. You may call it 40 hours. You may call it 36. We're going to provide health insurance. We're going to provide group life. We're going to do your 401k. That's fine, folks. ACA says 30 hours is full time. That's where you're hearing a lot of conversation today about are we or do we need to look at changing some of our employees to part time? Been following a little bit about the guy that owns Papa John's Pizzas? Yeah, he's been, he's been on a real tirade about that. So full time is 30 hours. And I'll also spend a little time talking about the part time and what that means. Health insurance exchange. Now, evidently, uh, there was an issue with the term exchange because just a couple of weeks ago, they decided to rebrand it and call it now the marketplace. I don't know what the connotation with the exchange was. But what is the exchange? The exchange is going to be where you can buy health insurance. You say, wait a second, I got an agent for that. Understand, the agent can also sell through the exchange here in your state. So a carrier can sell a QHP in as well as out of the exchange. It's going to be the same type con contract. But the agent can be involved in that. <clears throat> now, the exchange is the only place, the only place you can get your subsidy. That's why the carriers and the agents are going to want to be involved in the exchange. What basically is the best way to understand an exchange? I want you to circle where it says price, uh, where it says marketplace, and I want you to write priceline.com. It's basically an internet portal. It is not going to be a place where you can go in like today with your insurance agent, sit down, have a cup of coffee, wait for your agent to come see you. Uh-uh, it's not going to be that, folks. It's going to be an Internet portal. That's what it's going to be. You may be dealing with people that's in Bethesda, Maryland, or who knows what, okay? But that's, that's what we're going to be talking about there. Uh, the Change Navigator, I'm not going to really get into it other than just to mention that it's uh, an individual or entity that can assess, assist someone with the complexities of all of this insurance stuff. And you say, wait a second, that's me, the agent. Understand. But there can be people that can be competing against you as an insurance navigator or an exchange navigator. Recent changes, just a couple of these. Uh, how many of you just got finished sending out the W-2s? That was one of your jobs, to send out all the W-2s. Uh, some of you in here may have sent out more than 250 W-2s. Did you know that if you sent out 250 or more W-2s, on there you've got a new line item you now have to include on that, right there on 12D, the full cost of health insurance that you and the employee pays. Now, let's make sure you understand. One, are premiums that you as an employer pay still deductible? Yep. Are premiums that you pay still not reported to the W-2 employee? That is correct. Which begs the question, why the heck do we have to report it then? I don't know. Pick a reason. Don't know. 
But it used to be that starting in 11, every one of us, even if you had one employee, you'd have had to put that down. We're talking about what I pay for health insurance as well as what the employee pay. Put it all on that line uh, 12D. Now, I'm going to show you what I'm going to read here. Put the red line and take it away. IRS has been emphatic. They've been emphatic. This is not taxable. We just want you to understand, be aware of the total cost. Okay, so now you're aware, right? A lot of people say, does this mean down the road they may start to tax part of it? Speculate as you wish, folks. It's adamant that it is not, but who knows? You get Congresses in there that are looking for extra tax revenue. Who knows? I'm just telling you what, what the facts are here. All right, W uh, 1099 reporting $600. Uh, how many of you in here write insurance for trucking firms? Anybody? All right, you got trucking firms. Let's say that, that you've got me and I've got, say, 30 or 40 power units, and I own the trucking firm, you handle my, my uh, insurance. One of my big rigs pulls into a, a truck stop in Memphis, 18 wheelers, got those two side saddle fuel tanks. They hold 100 to 125 gallons each, depending on the configuration. So we got basically 200 gallons to be filled up. What is the cost of diesel today? Well, coming in yesterday, I saw it's uh, at least four bucks. Is that right? It's at least four bucks. Do the math. 200 gallons times four, four bucks, that's 800 bucks, folks. What this said, and thankfully it was repealed, starting in uh, 12, you and I would have had to report to the IRS, send a 1099 to everybody, including the IRS. If I go to Best Buy to buy computers or I buy whatever, any business that I, as a business, dealt with, if I spent $600 or greater, I would have had to send them a 1099. Now think of the soft cost for a trucking industry. Thankfully, that was repealed. Okay, we're going to go through the, the years leading up to uh, 14 pretty quick. Uh, insurance reform in 10. This was one of the first things that came about. To, to, how, how many of you got the letter that your kid that had graduated from college, uh, maybe they didn't have them a good job or whatever, they didn't have insurance, they go back on your plan. How, how many of you got the letter? Okay, that's what happened, folks. Uh, now, we had several states that already had laws like this. New Jersey, in fact, had as well as still has, get this, to age 30 in New Jersey. So we now made it mandated that on a health insurance plan, uh, starting that date, six months after the signing of the law, that your kids were back on your policy if they had no insurance. This included kids that were no longer at home, might have been married, not even in your state, might even had their own kids. Now, it did not extend to their spouse or their kids. It was them only, okay? And uh, typically, we're looking at uh, people that had aged out of the plan, that got out of college, no longer in school or whatever, and we've seen those come off the plans over the years. Grandfathered plans. Now, these are plans of insurance that were in force uh, when the law was signed in March of 10, and you had made very little changes, if any, to a plan. So this is a plan of insurance that you didn't make any changes, really, to the deductibles and the copays and things like that, how much the employees have to pay in premium. All right, so it shows their grandfathered plans will only provide coverage if the dependent had no other employer-sponsored plan. <clears throat> no coverage required for children who offered uh, benefits uh, through their own employer in that situation. This is a bridge program taking place until 1114, when every plan will now include that. And we picked up a lot of uninsured kids. 1.6 million, uh, the uh, CBO projected, between those ages of 19 and 25. And it really didn't have a huge impact on your health insurance premium. Most people felt this was a pretty good provision. Uh, let me back up here. Uh, prohibit uh, limits on, on placing limits on uh, the coverage. Now, a lot of health insurance plans already had no limit on a lifetime. They had no cap on lifetime, but almost all of them still had some type of annual limit. I mean, it would be like, how do we, how do we price a homeowner's if we don't have a limit? How do we price a GL if we don't have a dollar ceiling? Well, in this situation with health insurance, it was mandated that eventually there would be no limit. And so what we're going to have Lifetime limits went away in 10. There is no contract sold a day if it's a, a standard form uh, health insurance plan that has a, a, a lifetime limit. Eventually, in 14, so 1114, no plan of insurance that will be deemed a QHP will have a lifetime limit. And this gave a big discussion to the mini-med situation. 
Many meds are contracts that provide health insurance, but they have very low limits. I have a friend of mine that has a McDonald's franchise. He has 14 stores. And uh, through the McDonald's program, they have a mini med. So if you're working there, uh, you have a $40,000 annual benefit. That's it, 40,000 bucks. And you're gonna have $18, $19 taken out of your paycheck every two weeks for that. It's very low deductible, but it's very low limits. It would violate the law because look what it said. No plan in 11 could have an annual limit less than 750. This year, less than 2 million. So what do you think McDonald's said uh, to them when they said, look, in 11, we've got to have a plant seven, that has 750,000. And they said, well, ours has 40,000. What do you think McDonald's went and told them? If we're going to have to have a 750, what's going to take place? See ya. We're going to drop them. We're going to dump 65,000 people on the market that at least have some insurance. And so what happened, we gave them a waiver. Remember this big discussion a year or so ago? A lot of conversation about waivers. Health and Human Services took out their magic wand and they anointed McDonald's and Burger King and Red Lobster and Olive Garden and tons of businesses and said, okay, we're going to give you a waiver that your plan that you provide doesn't have to meet the maximum dollar, the, the minimum dollar limit. However, we're not taking any more waivers as of 11. It was too much of a political firestorm, so that they accepted no more. So we got about 1,500 companies that are on it now, but come 1114, if McDonald's provides insurance, it will be a QHP. What will its limit be? Unlimited, very good. What would the price of burger be? Don't know, you speculate. Uh, the owner of Papa John's Pizza said that pizzas are gonna be going up anywhere between 75 cents and a dollar each. That's what he, he made a, a statement on national TV about that. Pre-existing condition. Now, this is a big thing that a lot of people have struggled with, a number of states have struggled with over the years in regards to people that have medical conditions and can't get insurance. Because we know today, if you're looking at an individual policy, we're going to ask you some medical questions. And if you can't qualify, the carrier is going to say no. So we've got a couple of things that came about in 10. First one was the uh, precondition insurance program. They put out about $5 billion to all the various states to split up to use for if somebody has two triggers, they have a pre-existing condition, right? So you got a heart issue and you have been uninsured for at least six months. You're guaranteed you can get coverage and we're even gonna help subsidize. It's still expensive, but it's not like it would have been because you can get coverage. Uh, did you read what took place last week with this? Anybody see the, I know I've got one or two in here that knows about this. Yeah, what happened last week? They says we're out of money. No more. Now, we've only got about 100,000 people on this around the country. They're accepting no new ones now. Now, some, some states says we'll take it up to March 3rd. But we want to make sure we got enough money to carry these people on until the end of the year, when now then, if you've got a pre-existing condition, what's going to take place January 1st next year? No questions. So this was a bridge program, and they've got some issues there. Uh, children under 19, uh, if you buy a child-only policy, and some people go, why, why would somebody want to buy a child-only policy? How many of you know grandparents that have adopted their grandkids? I do. That's a perfect example. Here they are on Medicare. The child's got some pre-existing conditions that cannot be turned down. Now, we have 30 states, including mine, that have no carrier that will write a child-only policy. You will here, and there's 20 states that do. Uh, tax changes. Uh, the very first tax that came out that dealt with this was with the uh, indoor tanning salon. So you go there and get you a nice, beautiful tan. You're going to pay the fee. You're going to pay the tax, plus an extra 10% because they say this causes skin cancer. Uh, health insurance executives. We changed the law in 10. This was one of the major taxes that hit insurance carriers right off the bat. If you have a health insurance executive and they have a compensation greater than 500000 the insurance company can no longer take a tax deduction on that. 2010, uh, I'm sorry, 11, uh, wellness and preventive, that's the new buzzword, folks. This basically started many years ago at uh, Northwestern University back in the early 70s. Uh, they said, look, you know, if we can get people to be in stop smoking classes or we can get people to go to their doctor before they get sick. Hey, us guys, we wait till we get sick before we go to the doctor. But now then, you know, the, the wives and everybody saying, look, you know, you need to go before you're sick. That's a wellness plan. Okay, that's a prevention plan. 
And so the university started back in the 70s. A lot of the group plans by the late 70s were doing this. This was something that the big guys had. Everybody's going to have this now. So it's built in all of your plans, and many of you have taken advantage of that. You can't use the excuse, this is expensive, because it's no out-of-pocket, is it? You go in for your preventive. Tax changes. All right, we're going to cover just a few of the 21 that's going to have an impact on us. So these are new or revised taxes to help pay for the national health care. How many of you in here have an FSA, a flex spending account? All right. So you've got money in an FSA, you've got something that looks like a little credit card, you go to Walgreens and uh, you're putting money in, maybe your employer's doing some match or putting money in, and it's, uh, you know, it's a tax break for you, so if you make this and you defer uh, some money in an FSA, you only pay tax on that. And then when you go to Walgreens and you buy a prescription or you buy something that's, that's okay, then, then it's free. Look what they did in 11. They excluded over-the-counter meds. So it must be a prescription. My next door neighbor is my doctor. Now, how cool is that? That's one of my great insurance plans is have my doctor stay right next to me. He and I have a lot of fence time. We talk about stuff. He knows I understand this law, and I know he understands medicine. And so we talk about how it interacts together. Uh, in the spring of 11, I'm out there in the yard doing a little work, and he comes over and he says, Jerry, why in the world am I getting so many people calling my office wanting a prescription for extra strength Tylenol? Bingo. We're not dumb, folks. We're going to try to figure it out. I was in Chicago last week on a long road show and had a guy there who was telling me that his doctor now, if you want an OTC script, they charge you 10 bucks for the script. Is it extra expense for the doctor to write the? Yes, I you know, understand. But I'm just telling you what the rule says. Um, if you get money somehow from your FSA, HSA, HRA, somehow in an, uh, for a non-qualified medical expense purpose, you will pay tax on that money. So you take the money out of your FSA to buy something that you feel is an essential. Oh, 63-inch flat screen TV. That is not a QME, folks. That ain't one, okay? Uh, and they're going to eventually catch, catch you. You're going to pay tax on the full amount, plus it used to be a 10% penalty. It went to 20%. New fees on the pharmaceuticals, as I say, I mean, we're talking billions with a B, not millions. They're going to pass it along, the increased cost on all these scripts. Twelve, uh, we were originally going to have some major reductions in the rebates that the feds were due for your Medicare Part C. Now, I don't have enough time to really go into what Medicare Part C is, other than to just say that it is a plan of insurance that when you go on Medicare, A and B, hospital and doctor, you're still going to pay your Part B, which is about $105 a month. You could sign up instead of buying a Medicare supplement policy to fill all these gaps and deductibles, you could go under an Advantage plan. And a lot of plans cost how much? Anybody know how much some of them cost? Zero. Okay. How's it, how in the world does it cost zero? Because there's huge rebates from the feds. And so there's looks, looks like they've... Uh, you know, overcome some of that, but there's still some struggles going on in regards to the rebates for the Advantage plans. Uh, big fanfare was made in uh, August of 12 in regards to the uh, no-cost uh, preventive health things for women. Obviously, the uh, uh, Papa John's, I'm sorry, uh, Chick-fil-A and Hobby Lobby went, you know, they went ballistic. The Catholic charities and hospitals and uh, a lot of universities that are religious are affiliated. They had some problems, but it is what it is. We've got it. Thirteen. Now, I want to talk, first of all, of uh, use of e-filing. They, the ACA, is absolutely on a rampage that the hospitals and doctors will do e-filing. Eventually, to get their financial reimbursements, there won't be any checks, folks. It's all going to be EFTs. To get all this medical data, they will have to transfer it. Now, I know some of you and I have some issues with, you know, patients' rights and uh, HIPAA and protection, confidentiality of records and everything, but they're going to get this stuff. And a lot of people have some real issues with it. Another area that was going to be coming about this year was the co-ops. Co-ops was part of the fiscal cliff negotiation that got pushed off the cliff. 26 states took advantage of some of the uh, free money as well as uh, forgiveness grants. Now, I love it when they say it's loans, but we can, you can work your way to have it forgiven. Why don't we just call it a grant instead of a loan that's forgiven? But anyway, this is to set up a co-op, an insurance co-op. Now, most of us know what co-ops are. 
We have rural electric co-ops. We have farm co-ops. These are typically nonprofit, member-run. What we're going to be looking at is these co-ops to sell QHPs in 14 on the exchange in competition with the Blues and all the other carriers, uh, the Aetnas, uh, all of them. And uh, don't think you guys are going to be involved, uh, you know, compensation-wise with the co-ops. And so you know, a lot of people are saying, wait a second, they're sending all this money to compete against us as agents. That is correct. Tax changes in 13, some of these are very, very significant. <clears throat> Increase the tax hole, uh, the threshold for itemized deductions. Many of you have sat there that uh, wonderful Saturday and Sunday, probably in uh, <clears throat> late March, doing your own taxes. Some of you are going, oh my gosh, you're right, I've got to do that pretty soon. So you got your, uh, your 1040 worksheet. You've got your stack of uh, deductibles. You've got your two or three uh, 10, uh, 1099s or W-2s, and you start going through this, and you come across the item that says, if you have unreimbursed medical expenses and it exceeds 7.5% of your adjusted gross income, so your AGI is 100000 if you had $7,500 that your insurance company did not cover, in other words, you paid out of pocket, medical bills, deductibles, co-pays, glasses, uh, long-term care premiums. Let's say you had a total of $8,000. You could deduct $500. That's what that says. Nobody ever qualifies for this. We don't make it, folks. We always just go, oh, man, I just missed it. I'm going to take standard deduction. Evidently, one of you did, and so they fixed us. Everybody now is 10%. Somebody evidently did it. So now it's gone to 10% which will pretty well assure we don't do it. Now, if you're 65 or older, they've delayed that rule for two years for, for those ages. All right, our rich guys. All right, here we go. Here's our rich guy. Thank you for introducing me. I'm our rich guy. If your income exceeds that as an individual or that married filing jointly, we've got a special, a couple of new special taxes for you. One of them deals with the Medicare Part A. Make a note. This tax, even though it's on your Medicare Part A, 0.9%. What's wrong with 1%? Why don't they call it 0.9? But anyway, you, you, it's increased. <clears throat> it's a Medicare tax, folks. It doesn't go to Medicare. It goes to ACA. It doesn't go to Medicare. So that's one tax our rich guys got to pay. Secondly, when you sell an asset, you have a capital gain, okay? Now then, you bought it for this, you sell it for this, you held it for at least a year, you're going to pay a capital gain on the difference. We all understand how that works. Capital gains is 15%. Guess what? Our high income, if they're over those figures right there, they're going to pay an additional 3.8. Uh, I'd like for you to write two other figures down, 400000 and 450. The new tax rules that came into play, 1st of January. We got another special rule. If your income is 400000 single, 450 married, filing jointly, your capital gain went from 15 to 20. Not only did it go to 20, it also went to 20 plus 3.8. Lots of taxes coming in there. Uh, the, you guys that have on, that, that you're on a flex spending account, we're going to cap it at $2,500. It used to be whatever the plan document said. This, now it's going to be $2,500 of what you can defer. Make a note, it did not cap the employer portion, only the employee portion. This one just drove some people sideways. <clears throat> medical devices. Now, a lot of people are saying, you know, the medical device manufacturers, they're going to come out real good on this. They're going to make a lot of money. You know, I understand. But we've got a special tax that is applied to this industry that once you understand how it works, you go, you've got to be kidding me. It's a 2.3 on the gross. Okay. You've got a medical manufacturing, you make uh, heart valves, you make ceramic knees, you make x-ray machines, whatever. You make stuff for dentists. And this year you, you did 100 million in sales and you had 95 million in payroll, expenses, R&D, everything. And so you had you know, 5 million left over after your taxes, you had a pretty good year. Next year you have 100 million in sales and you have 105 in expenses. What does the 2.3 mean? The 2.3 is on the 100, irrespective of profit. So even if you have 105 in expenses and you lose money, you're still going to pay 2.3 on the 100 million. That is why we have seen some of these move to another country. 
the state of Ohio has the highest concentration of medical manu manufacturing companies in the United States. Several of them have already moved elsewhere in that situation. Uh, elimination for the employer's Medicare Part D. Uh, 3M and a number of companies have a thing that when you retire from them, they have a post-retirement perk package. All right, so Michelle, you retire, and you get all sorts of benefits as a retiree, but when you turn 65, they have one of several Part D. Now, Part D is what? That is your Medicare uh, par uh, pharmaceutical, so your drug benefit. This runs around $45 a month with a lot of carriers. 3M pays for it, and they got a tax deduction. Look what we're doing for that, no, starting this year, we're taking away that tax deduction. And they were not happy, but as well as a number of not. Okay, are you ready for 14? Okay, the big year. All right, somebody tell me what time it is so I know kind of where we are. It's what? It's 1230. <laughs> really? What time? 920. So I've got a total of what, 40 minutes to go? Is that about right? We're supposed to spend it or less? No, tell me or less. I got a lot of stuff to cover here. All right, we're going to talk about the, uh, the employer as well as the individual requirements, okay? First of all, you and I have to buy a QHP in 14. If we do not buy one, we have a non-compliance penalty. Now, <clears throat> large employers, 50 or more, FTEs, full-time employees, may be looking at a penalty if they do not provide insurance. Most people know that. But I've got more news for you. There's still people that do not understand this. Even if you do provide insurance, you may still be looking at a penalty. Did you know that? A lot of people find that very interesting, and I'm going to show you how that works. The rules are extremely complex, folks, and I'm going to try to keep it as, as fast-moving, but also you know, with, with a bunch of examples, and numerical examples, so you can kind of comprehend how it works. All right, this first is for an individual. All right, here we go. Michelle says, nope, I'm not going to buy it. Okay, fine. We're not going to put you in jail. We're just going to have a penalty for you. You fall under the requirement. You've got to buy a plan. Now, there are four plans, 90-10, 80, 20, 70, 30, 60, 40. 60, 40 is called a bronze plan. You fail to buy the lowest cost plan. You're going to have a penalty of the greater $95 for the whole year. That is not a misprint, folks. It's not $95 a week or $95 a minute. It's $95 for the whole year. Now, if she buys an individual plan at her age, she may be looking at uh, $300 a month. So $3,600, $4,000 a year, whatever. Take your time. Would you rather spend $4,000 or $95? Take your time. <laughs> There's not enough teeth in the penalty, folks. Okay? But you see it says the greater of $95, then it's going to be going up to $325, then up to $695. Then we even got penalties if you have dependent children. And it says the greater of, then you have a percentage of your income, 1%. Let me give you an example of how that works. Michelle has a family of four. Her income is 100000 What is magical about 100000 Not eligible for a subsidy. She's above 92 .2. Remember that number? She's not eligible. Her penalty is going to be 95 on her, 95 on hubby, and half 95 on the two kids. 285 or 1000 bucks. 1% 1 of 100000 Pays the greater of that. Now, a family of four... Seven, eight, ten thousand dollar premium nationally, at least that, maybe less than that here. So there's not enough real teeth in the penalty in that situation there. The penalty is prorated for the number of months without coverage. So if you went one month without coverage, at first glance you would think, well, I'm going to pay one twelfth of the penalty. But let's read a little further. However, the rule states that there is no penalty for a single gap, not multiple gaps, a single gap of less than three months. It's not a, it's not three months. It's less than three months. So there is a way to escape that. So an example in the prior slide, had no coverage for four months. They're not eligible for the exemption. They're going to be looking at uh, one-third of 285 or one-third of 1,000. They're going to pay the grade of the two numbers. That's how it's going to work. Some people have said this is going to be the CPA retirement plan program, too. I don't know. Okay. So individuals and their tax dependents will have to prove you and I are going to have to prove we have a QHP. Now, when we talk about QHPs, will Medicaid be a QHP? Yep. Will Medicare be a QHP? Absolutely. Those on TRICARE? Yep. Your qualified plans through your employer, uh, self-employed, that's what we're talking about. 
So you're going to have to prove this. Well, it appears, and we have not got 100% guidance yet. We're still expecting stuff to come out uh, this spring. When you file your taxes, there's some very important numbers. You have your Social Security number. I have a federal ID number if I'm your employer and Blue Cross has a policy number. Somehow, electronically, that's all going to be tagged. We're not sure how that's going to work. Uh, it might be that your exchange or the marketplace provides something. There may be something that goes in right with your W-2. We don't know. So just watch for that. And so those of you that get involved in the financial area in regards to documentation for your employees, you'll see stuff taking place this year. Okay, you ready for the large employer stuff? This is what a lot of people uh, still have a lot of confusion about. We're talking about full-time employees, 30 hours or more. What about your part-time? We're going to talk about what goes on in regards to the calculation of your part-time. Now, just kind of understand or make yourself a note, if you never hit 50 in 14, you have zero chance of any penalty. And that's why a lot of people are going to do everything they can to not hit 50 full-time employees. Let's take a look at the two scenarios. We've got a business, a large business. Okay, so we've got a large employer that one does not offer coverage. What does the penalty say? Now, I'm going to read it to you. You're going to have a hard time comprehending it. Then I'm going to give you an example and it'll make it a little easier to follow. All right. First of all, if any full-time employee, here he is. He's the only guy. It says any. So you guys are working for me. I have 50 or more. If any full-time, he's the only one that got a premium subsidy and the only place he can get it is through the exchange. If he gets that, he is going to tag me with a penalty for the entire 12 months because you can see at the end it says it's prorated monthly. So if it goes a whole 12 months like this, I'm going to get hit with a penalty of $2,000 on every full-time, but we're going to forgive the first 30. Huh? What does that mean? Let's look at an example. All right, here we go. Good old Jerry has 65 full-time employees and one gets a subsidy. All it takes is one, folks. We're going to take our 65, less our 30. Don't ask me why they came up with 30. I don't know, okay? So we got 30 times $2,000. If it was for the entire year, that is $70,000. Now, are penalties, fees, and levies ever deductible by business. Never, folks. So this would be a non-deductible penalty. Now, as I go through point out problems, I'm also going to try to show you where there may be some, some escape hatches. If you've got more than 50 people working for you, what if you never had more than 30 full-time? What if we had, you know, we had a bunch of part-time, but you never had more than 30 full-time? Remember, we're always going to take away 30. So that's one way to escape this. And that's why a lot of businesses right now are trying to decide, okay, do we change a lot of people to part-time? Now, what would be part-time? 29, 29 and a half. And you better have a written rule, folks. They never violate. I had a lady in one of the meetings I did recently they, that she's with the big bank. She says, now, if we've got this rule and we've got a branch bank, one of our branches out here, and we've got a couple of uh, tellers call in sick, and you're, you're the only one there, and you're not supposed to work more than 29 and a half a week, are we going to shut the branch? I'm going, I understand. So this is a tough decision that businesses are going to have to look at in that situation. I told you I would tell you what it's called in the law multiple places. Instead of calling it a tax or a fee or a levy, that's what it is called. A shared responsibility payment. Now, don't you feel a lot better about it sending in your money knowing that that's what it's called? Now, possible penalty for an employer that does. All right, here we go. Good old Jerry has a 65-employee business. Folks, I'm probably looking at a premium of what, 500, 600? Where, where's Jared? Where's Jared? I was talking to Jared earlier. Five, 600,000? Easily, okay. So I'm paying five, 600,000, or I'm paying a good portion of the five or 600,000. That's still deductible. I've got employees paying some of their portion. So here I am paying the premium, and here's what the rule says. I still have a chance of a penalty. It says if any full-time, so it's the same rule to start with until it gets right here, the lesser. All right? Any full-time receives a premium assistance. So here we go. You got a, pre you got a premium assistance. I'm looking at the lesser of 2,000 or 3,000 on everybody. 
Here is how that would work. I am paying my four, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollar premium, taking a tax deduction, and now then I have 15 of you get a subsidy. How are they going to get a subsidy? They're eligible to start if they're below 400% FPL. That's one way. I'll talk about others in a minute. And if that's the case, we're going to look at the two calculations, same as before, but now then uh, 15 times 3,000, $45,000. So I am going to pay the premium plus the non-deductible penalty. This is where a lot of businesses are struggling whether to continue providing health insurance or not. Now, I know some of you are thinking, okay, what about my part-time? What can they do to me? Let's talk about this with my hypothetical Joe's Burgers and Shakes. Joe has three locations, 40 full-time employees, and he's got a fair number of part-time. He's got college kids and high school kids and seniors. Uh, and those of you that keep up with the, the time cards and everything, you, you know that you got some that'll work eight hours a week, some 12, some. We're going to keep it simple, folks. I'm going to say that every one of our 20 part-time work exactly 24 hours. And you and I know that's not the way it works. But we're going to keep it simple. What do we do? Because you have got to do the calculations. Did you know your part-time employees can make you become a large employer? Because Joe, at first glance, with 40, is not a large employer, is he? He's under 50. But look at what your part-time can do. What the rule says you've got to do on a monthly basis is take your part-times, times the number of hours, 24, times the number of weeks. We've now got 1,920 part-time hours. It then it says divide by 130. Now, what is 130? Well, originally when the law came out, it was 120. 120 would be four weeks times 30 hours. But, well, you know, we got a few months that's got 31 days. we got many that have 30. we got this one that has 29, sometimes 28. So it now says 130. And we come up with what's known as a full-time equivalency. And that factor is 14.8. We round it to the nearest number. We now have 15. And look what our part-time has just done to Joe's Burgers and Shakes. Joe is now a large employer in that situation. So since Joe is a large employer, he is going to be looking at two scenarios here. Does he offer coverage or does he not offer coverage? And if he does not offer coverage, look at what Joe is going to have happen. And I got a feeling a lot of businesses like Joe's does not offer coverage. Would you agree with that? And would you also agree that many of these people are low income and they're going to be looking at, at FPL subsidies? And if that's the case, 20,000 bucks. What if he does offer coverage? Okay. Well, he could, he could have a lot of them get, get a subsidy. And in this situation, we're going to look at the lesser of the two, $20,000. This is probably going to have an impact on Joe. And I guarantee you, from the stuff I do around the country, the businesses do not know this. And how they are not knowing this is that their agents are not conversing with them. Their HR, I mean, these people typically don't have an HR. And so they don't know what's going on. They're going to react at some point in time. They're going to have a problem. I comment that he's talking about is it's going to be based on 2013. I'm showing that coming right up in the next two or three slides. Yeah, because we've got a thing called measurement that we're going to take a look at. You've got two options to do your measuring. And right now, folks, is when you need to start doing that. I'm going to show you that coming right up in just a second. Now, how do we determine full-time status? You've got two basic options. Okay? As he was commenting, you've got what's called real-time, and you've got look-back. Look-back is this year. It says that you can do a snapshot this year no less than three months, no greater than 12. So you can take a time frame of three or four months and do a snapshot of exactly what your full-time, part-time is looking at. Because do we have some, say, like, uh, let's say the Y, your YMCA. Do they, in the summertime, their, their employees, part-time people grow a lot because of the uh, uh, people in summer camps and all? Yeah. So you can do a look back. You need to be dealing with, get your HR or whoever you're dealing with, uh, your accountant or whatever, to give you some good advice here. You probably do not want to use what's called real time. Real time is next year, and you're going to do this on a month-to-month -month basis looking back because we have a significant COBRA activity if you're not careful. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's say that you have a written rule that says when you hit 30, you get health insurance. Well, look at this part, these part-time hours here. We got some real issues. Well, this guy now, now is no longer full-time. And now then we got to start, you know, go through the enrollment period, the coverage notification for COBRA. 
Can you see all sorts of headaches with you, your health insurance provider, in this situation? So that's why you probably, right now, need to start looking at doing the, you know, the calculation for 2013, as you pointed out. Consider this potential situation for an uninformed business owner. Let's say that we've got mountaintop golf course and resort. They have 49 employees. Now, what's magical about 49? They're, under, they're, they're not 50. They're not a large employer. And if they're not a large employer and they don't provide health insurance, any chance of a penalty? It's a resounding no. So they have no penalty whatsoever. However, business picks up and they make a sound business decision to hire another employee. And we're going to have that employee for the full year. This was made on sound business practices, but they forgot to factor in ACA, folks. This going forward, you've got to factor in ACA on some of these practices too, because look what happens in this situation. If just one gets a subsidy, this business just got hit with a $40,000 non-deductible penalty based on a sound business decision. Guy comes in, he's got his auto repair bill. He's questioning the bill with Al, the owner of Al's garage. Al says, oh, you want a breakdown? Yep, well, that's 117 for parts, that's 75 for labor, and that's 321 for health insurance. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. Just break it up a little bit there. Tell me the time, please. Don't say 1130. I'm sorry, 30, perfect, perfect, 35. All right, so you guys, large employers, are going to have to make some tough decisions about this. Uh, the businesses that you write their property and casualty insurance, they're going to have to make some tough decisions. They better be getting some good, sound advice and looking at some things. Because when you're looking at the large employer, all it's going to take is one. Well, do we switch a lot of people to part-time? I don't know. One thing to understand, though, the penalties are only triggered on full-time. What if he's a part-time employee? What if a part-time employee gets a subsidy? No penalty. Now, my part-times do one thing, as we saw with Joe's Burgers. We use the hours to see if we push him over to be a large employer, 50 or more. But once that happens, we forget about it. So even he gets a subsidy, no problem. Only my full-times getting that subsidy, that's what can trigger us with a penalty in that situation. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. How can I become a small employer? What are some things I can do? Well, let me introduce you to a little something called control groups, and I'm going to put a little something right there that hopefully gets your attention. That's, that's worse than the frowning face, okay? That's just going to blow up in your face if you try to do something. Because in this situation, here is what we've got. We've got Mom and Dad, Inc. sitting out there listening to me as I'm doing one of these programs around the country, and they say, oh, my gosh, this is horrible. We, own six, we have this business, this corporation, and we have 60 employees. We are a large employer. If we don't offer coverage, we know we're going to get a penalty. If we do offer coverage, we may still get a penalty. I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to get with our accountant, our attorney, and we're going to change it and have two corporations. Anybody ever thought of doing something like that? You sit here long enough, you see these numbers, you'll think about it. Let me tell you, folks, they're way ahead of you. They're way ahead of this. Also, this basically started way back with ERISA in 74 because people with, with qualified plans tried to do things like this. Folks, they don't slap you on the wrist. They cut your wrist off. There is a chance, there is a chance of a potential $500,000 penalty you pull this stunt. You deal with an attorney or CPA that does not know his or her stuff, just be aware, okay? So just, just be very, very careful there. They're way ahead of you, all right? Now, so we're looking at potential penalty, as I said, individual or business. Uh, if coverage is provided. Is the premium affordable? Now, I've spent a lot of time talking about the 400% FPL and that you were eligible. Just because you're under 400% FPL does not mean you're automatically going to get a subsidy. Basically, when you read all the text of what the law says, the ACA crafters said, look, we want everybody to have good quality health insurance. Hey, everybody would love to do that. A lot of us are questioning how we're going to pay for this. These penalties, though, that employers are looking at, one, if you pay your employees enough salary so that they are not under 400% FPL. Now, that's wonderful. That's admirable. I can tell you in the panhandle of Florida, that 
don't work. And I got a feeling in some areas of the Carolinas, that won't fly either. So, if we don't pay them enough salary, how about if we pay enough of the premium? That one might work. And that's where we get into the issue of called affordability. So the employers, as I said several times, are not required to provide a QHP. The individual, you've got to buy it, otherwise the penalty. But the likelihood, as you saw me go through this scenario with, with the potential penalties, are really going to get mine and your attention. And I think we as health insurance agents, property casualty agents, at least need to have a walking around knowledge on this to make certain that these people are talking to people that are knowledgeable, accountants, uh, attorneys, uh, they're, they're, if they've got uh, HR people, that they're researching everything properly on that. Now, here is the big deal right here. So this is the, basically the third issue. If you, if you don't pay them enough money, you're looking at maybe a penalty if you're in a large employer. If you do pay them enough money, no problem. Well, what if somebody is under 400% FPL? Because all around the country, you're going to have a lot of cities, a lot of businesses where that's just going to be uh, automatic. So here's what the, the question really comes down to. And it's a multiple part question. Is any employee under 400%? So here we are, you're under 400% FPL. At first glance he says, oh, I'm eligible for a subsidy. The more you go down, the more your subsidy goes up. You get to 250, now you start getting help with your out of pockets. Number two is still a hard one that we struggle with because we're waiting for some more guidance from HHS. Does the employer provide a plan that pays at least 60% of health, expense, health insurance expenses uh, for the typical population? It does not mean premium. It means, does it provide their expenses? Would a plan here that is a fairly broad plan maybe be not broad enough in Washington, D.C. or New York City? Possible. Okay. So let's kind of disregard that one. What we want to focus on is number three. Is the employee's required contribution affordable? Many of you pay a good portion. Some of you may even pay 100% of your employees' health insurance premiums. Many of you pay nothing or very little of the dependents. That's just what national stats tell us. Now, when I pay all of your premium, your pre not your family, your premium, you have absolutely a, you have a non-starter when it comes to unaffordable because it's not. It's definitely affordable. I'm paying it all. But what if... I am paying 80% and you're having to pay 20%. We're going to have to do a calculation to see if it is greater than 9.5% of employees' household, household income for self-only coverage. You say, how the heck do I know what the spouse makes? Can, can we, from an HR standpoint, really go around asking that question? And you and I know the answer is probably not. That's why I got the start there. We're waiting for some guidance there to see if it's basically going to eventually shake out and say employees' income. So if I am paying almost all the premium and you're paying very little, and we have to do this little calculation to see if it's unaffordable, then it may trigger a penalty. So the only way you can get a penalty is one, you're under 400% FPL, and two, your required portion for your only portion is deemed unaffordable. So how can we escape a penalty as a large employer, pay enough of her premium so that it's not deemed unaffordable? That's how we can get around it. So that's where the agents and the uh, specialists that work in this area will probably give you some advice on what to do in situations like that. So let's do a little quick review of this. If you're under 50, any chance of a penalty? Zero chance. And a lot of businesses are going to do everything they can to never hit 50. And in fact, if you're 25 or fewer, you may even have a chance for a subsidy of the premiums you guys pay. Now, if you're 50 or more and you do not provide, what's going to happen? All it takes is one. All it takes is one. And we're going to look at a, a $2,000. We're going to skip the first 30. So as an example at the bottom, we got 100 employees. One gets a penalty, or gets the subsidy. I'm going to have 100 less 30. I've got 70 left over times 2,000. I have now got hit with a $140,000 ACA penalty. Now, is a $140,000 non-deductible better than four or $500,000 deductible premium? Think about it. That's what, that's what businesses are going through right now. They're struggling with that. Second scenario, same rules to the left, but it's the lesser of... And so we go through and do the same calculations. We come down to 100. Well, how, how many got the subsidy? So in that situation, we say 30 got a subsidy. 
So now then in that scenario, we'll be looking at the lesser, which would be $90,000. All right. Now, on a premium, as your income goes down and you're eligible for a subsidy, so there you are, you're going to be paying a certain amount of premium. When you get to 200%, let me just kind of go through what the numbers are going to be. If you're at 200%, here you are, Michelle, you're a single person, you're making $22,000 a year. Age has nothing to do with this now. It's your income. You're looking at uh, uh, $22,000, you are at 200%. The maximum you're going to be paying for your qualified health plan would be 6.3%, which is going to work out to be about $116 a month. So if your premium is uh, here, you've got a maximum amount you're going to be paying for there. So the, the exchange and the calculations are going to be doing all of this for you. Verse, also, when you got below 250 FPL, now then you get some help with your out-of-pockets. Insurance reform and delivery... <clears throat> Uh, I've been giving you some bad news. The last few slides, folks, ain't going to get any better. And in fact, it's probably going to be going downhill a little bit. I'm going to be covering a few things that you did not know. And if you've got the handout, there's one or two things that that's on, I'm going to have on the screen that's not in your handout. Notice what rolled out December the 9th. It said starting 1-1-14, every qualified plan, that means a large employer, it means small employer, it means an individual plan. Every plan is going to contain a $63 annual per enrollee fee. Yes, it is non-commissionable, as you could quickly figure out. And it's going to continue for three years, and it's going to raise about $25 billion. And it's going to be split as follows. About 17.5% is going to go to ACA for a couple of different programs. But the majority is going to go to the insurance companies. Now, why? to cushion the potential expense, initial expenses and potential losses because we're going to be taking you guaranteed issue, no underwriting questions. Are we going to have this little thing called adverse selection big time? And so this is going to cushion this blow. Let me show you what this means. Now, I'm going to put this at the top. I want you to go to Google, and I want you to bring this up. And I was looking at it last night, and I think it's the third or fourth one down. When you type in at the very top, PPACA transitional reinsurance fee Crawford. You're going to bring up the, the Crawford advisors, and it's the third or fourth one down, and it, it's uh, probably about a thousand page narrative. Very good narrative. I want you to go and visit this because some of you are going to doubt what I say. I'm sorry, it's the facts. What I'm going to talk about here deals with what it says right here on the screen. All right, the $63 uh, dollar per head fee. Did that just sink in? Per head fee will help stabilize the market, etc. So what I want to focus is right here, it says here, includes employees and dependents. Individual plans, group plans, large, small is going to be added to $63 or $5.25 a month to every, everyone. Your carriers will be mandated to remit it. I guarantee you they're going to increase your premiums. There's no question about it. Now, what does this mean? I called up my brother maybe uh, five weeks ago, and uh, he works for a company that has 176 employees. Connie, the HR person, and I went to school, and so she and I talk a lot about this. She's very curious, and so she helped me out. They pay 80% of the premiums for the employee where he works. It's a manufacturing company. Currently at that time, they had 164 covered lives. They had 103 spouses. They had 209 dependents. So that's 476 total heads, if you will. All right? They've also got 11 on, that's COBRA beneficiaries, and they've got nine retirees. They now have a total of 496. Look what this means. Your premium will be going up. Also, where they work, they hire a lot of people at just basic labor at $12 an hour. Do you think those people are going to be eligible for subsidies because they're below 400% FPL? We're going to do the calculations since they pay 80% of the premium. Let's just assume that we have 20 of them get a subsidy times 3,000. And here we go. And take a look at what my brother's business where he works may very well be looking in, in regards to an extra fee. And this is not a misprint at the last sentence, folks. You're going to be looking at least 20% additional premiums next year. How many of you have heard that, that figure or more? Some are saying 30% because we've got extra coverages, 
the carriers are going to get, uh, you know, they're, they're just, they're nervous about all this. Here's your state. Your state is that one right there. Uh, plan for the partnership exchange. I'm sorry, the, uh, yeah, partnership exchange, uh, the, the federal. So you're going to do the partner with the feds. Uh, you got a number of states that have uh, set up, like uh, others, that, that's going to be setting up their own exchange. Then you've got 25 of them, like Florida, that said, nope, we're not going to do it. We're going to default to the federal exchange. And so that's what that's kind of going on with the exchange. And we could have a long conversation on exchanges, but we don't have time for that. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, good question. Does this apply to governmental units? Yes, it applies to private businesses. It applies to public businesses. Uh, I had a number of school boards that I've done stuff for, political subdivisions, uh, yes, uh, charities, churches, nobody's exempt. Even Congress, and I know there's all sorts of stuff on the Internet, no, they're not exempt. They're, they're under this, okay. And uh, if you go to the Kaiser site and go to the states, you can find uh, what your state is looking at in regards to the exchange. That's the four plans that I talked about. What you're going to see, I think, is you're going to see carriers come out with some niche sale areas. They're going to come out with uh, deductible waiver plans. In other words, you buy a plan of insurance, and if you have an accident that's not job-related, we'll waive that. We'll waive that deductible. So I think you're going to see, you're going to see a number of carriers come out with niche sale. Just watch for the white duck when his beak gets all well to start talking about uh, more and more things that uh, you know employees can buy on a payroll deduction or whatever, and I, you'll see a number of companies. How are we doing on time, Stuart? Good, perfect. All right. Now, this is one of the major things in regards to what's going on with health insurance in 14. We are going to ask no questions regarding your health. We don't care about your prescriptions. We don't care about your surgeries. We don't care about your mental condition, your physical condition. We cannot ask those. Kind of goes along the same way of what HR has to do now when they hire somebody, right? There are a lot of things they can't ask. Well, uh, how would you like to write some property and casualty insurance and not be able to underwrite it? That's what we're talking about. So how is this going to work? What can we ask? Well, the application, I think, is going to be pretty doggone simple. There's only certain things that we will have to ask and lots of things we can never even touch. First of all, we're going to have to follow certain age rating maximums. And you see the three to one limit. All right, Michelle is far younger than the old guy here, okay? The old guy typically has a lot more medical issues than the young lady. To be proper from an actuarial standpoint, I should pay 4.5 uh, ratio versus her premium. But you see, the maximum that the carrier can use is 3.3 to 1, which means her premium is going to be disproportionately higher. Michelle, us old guys, appreciate that, I tell you. Okay? Rating area in Florida, obviously, where I live in Panama City, is lower cost than, say, Miami. And you certainly have those areas in, in and around North Carolina. Family composition, a family of four versus a single, obviously we can charge more, so we can do that. And then the new one, now this has been in the, the, the stats all the time. It's, it, says, it says tobacco can have a 1.5 to 1 ratio. But let me give you what has just rolled out on this. And as I have had people in some of the classes that I've done in the last two, three, four weeks, they said, you know, you've just motivated me to stop smoking. Or you've just motivated, made, vote, motivated me to set up in our business a non-tobacco uh, uh, campus or whatever. So what it says, 1.5 to 1. Now, what that means, if this is your premium and you use tobacco, now, it doesn't say smoke. It says tobacco. Now, I'm dealing with all insurance people here. Many of you have filled out life insurance applications, and you say you smoke or don't smoke. It don't matter. We don't take your word for it. We're still going to require your analysis, right? That's what the carriers do. And we're going to find something, either a yes or a no. And you're going to pay 17 to 20% higher with, with typically a tobacco usage policy. Do you think the carriers are going to be paying the money to find out if you really and truly do use tobacco or not? I cannot see this, folks. So how are we going to do this? So I sit down with you and I say, uh, Michelle, uh, do you use tobacco? And she goes, why do you want to know? Well, if you don't, your premium is here. If you do, it's here. And her answer is going to be, not really then. I don't really use it. Oh, I only smoke when I go out with the girls maybe once or twice. So excuse me, I didn't ask if you did. Every now and then, I ask if you smoked at all or used tobacco. 
Notice what it says. No FPL subsidy. So let's say that you're now the tobacco user. You're working for me, and you go to the exchange to get your subsidy. Here's your premium. You're going to do to your income. Your subsidy is going to be here. So basically out of pocket, your premium is going to be down here because of your subsidy. But look what it says. If you buy an individual plan, there is no way to get a FPL subsidy on the tobacco surcharge. If you're on a group plan, the only way to get a subsidy for the FPL, uh, to, on the FPL because of tobacco usage is, and get this nonsense, folks. I'm sorry, this is lunacy right here. It says to enroll. It doesn't say you graduate. It doesn't say you stay. It says you enroll in a stop smoking program. Maybe we're going to get some more guidance come out down the road on this. I don't know. But right now this is here. And when I read this, I'm like, okay, I've got some issues with this. How are we going to find out if you really smoke or not? And so it's okay if you use, to, if you use marijuana. It's okay. <laughs> because it says tobacco. <laughs> Excuse me. I've got an issue with that. That's just me. Let me give you an example. Let's go back to Al, my garage guy, okay? Al is 58, single, auto mechanic. Earns 35. Now, what's magical about being single and earning 35? He is under 45, so he's eligible for an FPL subsidy. And uh, does not have a QHP, uh, QHP through his employer. He's also a smoker. Assume that his qualified health plan costs 9000 annually, and his carrier files the maximum 1.5 surcharge. They're going to hit him with a $4,500 smoking surcharge. If that's the case, he is not eligible for any subsidy on that 4500 It's going to get his attention. How about this one? Let's say that the national average is $14,000 for a premium. We got a husband and wife, no dependents, they make 100 they They're not eligible for a subsidy. They're both tobacco users, and the carrier uses a maximum of 1.5 surcharge. Look what their premium just went to. They've got three options, folks. Pay the premium. Maybe they can find a carrier on the marketplace that gives them a better deal. That, that's possible. Or say, to heck with that, we're going to pay the $1,000 penalty. But look at the potential bankruptcy they, they risk in that situation. And that is the rules on that. All right. Uh, we've talked about most of these. Also, we're going to have a maximum uh, deductible that you can put on a plan. It cannot exceed that of what the same deductible of an HSA uh, if you have a new enrollee to your business, the maximum you can go before, uh, uh, no, you can't go longer than 90 days for them to be on your plan. Uh, every state can broaden the coverages, uh, but you can't take away from anything that's mandated on ACA, and I'm going to show you the basic coverages in just a second. To find out what North Carolina can, is doing, you can go to the National Council National Conference for State Legislatures. And those of you who got the handout, you got that, and you can see what North Carolina is doing. You'll bring up a little site, and you can uh, scroll down and see what North Carolina is doing there. Now, coverage requirements. Three or four more slides, and we're going to be done here. Coverage requirements. As was mentioned, does everybody fall under the law? Yes. Governments, political subdivisions, private, uh, everybody, including charitable organizations. And here are the plan minimum requirements. I would like for you, if you've got a handout, put a bracket right here. Put a bracket there on one side and just write no dollar limit because that's what we mean here, no dollar limit. Most of these we have no problem with. it. Ambulatory, patient services, emergency, hospitalization. You go in for an appendectomy. Covered, folks. No problem. No limit. Next one, maternity and newborn. Newsflash. Some of us in this room don't need this. Can I today buy an individual policy for my wife and I and not include maternity? Yep. Can I in 14? Nope. Are oh, we going to have a little extra fee in the premiums for that? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, mental health and substance use disorders, including behavioral health treatment. Some people refer the, to this as the Hollywood endorsement. That's just me. <clears throat> but anyway, if you have a business that has 50 or more employees and you provide insurance, you fall under the 1997 Mental Health Parity Act. No questions asked. You fall under it. 50 or more and you provide health insurance, which basically says mental health is, is covered as any other illness. Same limits. You can't put a dollar limit. We're going to have no limit on this. 
uh, prescription drugs, rehab, ambulatory, I'm, I'm sorry, lab services, preventive wellness, all these things automatically in the plan. You can't take them out. And your state may have extra things they have layered on. Everybody will be required to buy it, you and I, except a few exemptions, all right? Religious objections, and there are a few file religions that insurance is against their religion. Now, if they have an appendectomy, they go to the local hospital, will they be turned away? No, it's just probably a bankruptcy. What this means, and just put a little bracket right over here, no penalty, so no $95 penalty, or no 1% penalty in 14. That's what we mean here. So financial hardship, if you've uh, you know, had certain income, there's, there's a few little basic rules there. If, you, if, the in, if the premium that you're having to pay exceeds a certain amount, then uh, you, you can file for that one. Undocumented immigrants, they don't fall under the law. American Indians, and you've got a lot of tribal uh, treaties uh, with the United States government that a lot of these uh, Indian nations have their own insurance plan. Uh, those incarcerated cover very well, as we know. Uh, citizens not reside in the U.S., uh, people under, under, in, under the tax filing threshold don't have, to, don't have to do this. They earn it long enough. They're going to be on Medicaid, as we know. And I talked about that short gap of less than three months. All right. We've talked about many of these. Uh, Medicare Advantage plans in 14 is going to then go under the 85% MLR rule. We're going to greatly expand Medicaid. We're going to be probably picking up somewhere between 30 to 35 million people on Medicaid. We've talked about how that's going to, oh, preventive wellness. We can have a wellness reward. Did you know that your business may even can file for a wellness grant if you're less than 100 employees? Check that out. It's kind of interesting. And we've talked about these various taxes and fees and all these various things here. Now, all right, we are getting real close to being done. A couple of little things I want to do. We've got some later stuff coming into play here I'm not going to touch on. What I want to do now, let's end on this. You guys are all PNC. I do a lot of programs for non-insurance groups, a lot of various industries around the country. And I love it when I talk to my fellow brothers and sisters in the insurance business because I can talk like it is. I can talk about insurance stuff. What if somebody's really having a hard time understanding how this law works? One of the great things I think you and the PNC, you can equate to what I've discussed to property and casualty insurance. Uh, if I am correct, you guys have 100 counties in North Carolina, is that correct? You also have a county named Monroe County, is that correct? Well, in Florida, we have 67 counties. We also have a number of counties named after former presidents, including Monroe County. Anybody in here ever been to Monroe County, Florida? Major city is what? Key West. Key West. Now, can you imagine insurance companies don't like Key West? I mean, we had this little issue with wind. Okay, we just got a little, it's just a little issue every now and then. And so what we're going to do, we're going to have a little fun at the end here. And imagine that you are my homeowner's agent in Key West, Florida. And I come in to see you on some insurance on my house. And you and the carrier that you're riding with is going to have to follow the exact same rules on insurance that I've been talking almost uh, an hour and a half on health insurance. So PNC has got to follow the same rules. So let's just see how that would work in that scenario. I come in and I want some coverage. Guaranteed, right? I got it. Now, in Florida, I guarantee if I go in and want insurance with a, with a carrier in Miami or South Florida, Key West, I'm going to get insurance, but it's going to be with a company called The Citizens. Guaranteed, folks. But every one of your carriers will have to take me. Now then, no underwriting questions. You can't ask me about how many times I've been in prison for burning houses down and insurance fraud and, you know, how bad my wiring on my house is and that I've got two Rockweilers that just love to chew people to death. None of that matters. No underwriting. <clears throat> Guaranteed renewable next year. Pretty good year. Only had one covered claim a month. Some of them actually pretty small. Now, what happens in the insured world today? 90 days before my renewal, I'm going to get a little greetings letter from your carrier say, end of, end of it, we're out of here. Uh -uh, won't happen next year. What's going to happen? I'm going to get the same renewal that everybody's in my class. Now remember, also, I didn't point this out, but did you know we can't ask gender questions? Females and males are going to pay the same questions. So if we're the same ages, whatever, we got a similar health insurance, no difference on premiums, same thing on my house. I'm going to get a guaranteed renewal in that situation. 
How much, how much coverage do I have on my house? Whatever it takes. How much liability? Whatever it takes. I mean, how do you come up with a premium for BP on an oil spill if you've got no limit? I don't understand. Everyone's got to have coverage. Why? What do you mean? I have my house paid off. I don't want to buy insurance. Sorry, you got to buy it. Not happy. However, my income is kind of low, so you nice folks are going to help me out a little bit with my premium. I could possibly get eligible from a standpoint of subsidy on my premiums. Don't get real happy with all these commissions either because we're going to have a little uh, MLR rule with our uh, PNC carriers, and so that's probably going to impact your commissions good time. We're also going to have a no-cost, well-living, preventive program built in this homeowner's policy. I call you up and I say, you know, I've been reading my policy. That's always scary. We know that. <clears throat> and I came across this thing called no-cost, wellness, and preventive. My hot water heater is made, making sounds it has never made. I think I need me a new one. My 50-year-old tin roof is beginning to show its age. I think I need me a new one. And then the last one. The last one. Would you hand me your cell phone? Is that a cell phone? Let me borrow your cell phone just a second. I want to borrow this cell phone to give you the last little dramatization. <clears throat> I have a uh, little grease fire in my house, and I can't get it out. I can't find my extinguisher, or I find it, and I can't get it to work. And so, my gosh, what am I going to do? Because I don't have any insurance. But I have my cell phone. Nowhere in the law can I find what a waiting period for coverage is. I can't find it in the law. So in my speed dial, I have my agent. I've got the exchange. I call up my agent and say, bind me some coverage for health insurance. Now, with another federal program called Federal Flood, we got a 30-day wait, don't we? Unless there's a closing. I can find nothing in the law where it says there's a waiting period. This adds to adverse selection. So. My little grease fire is getting worse and worse. I call you up and say, hey, bind me some coverage. Send me a barcode or a QR reader or something that shows me exactly when it was bound. And that's lunacy also, folks. And they, they may come out with some stuff that clarifies that and says, no, we didn't. But in the law, it's not there at this point in time. So anyway, what I have done is, is hopefully giving you a little bit of information that uh, gives you a little clarity, and I know uh, Vince and the association is going to have me in, in in April to do a six-hour program where I get real deep on a lot of this. We'll have a pretty lengthy handout. And I'll be around after we finish for any questions you might have, and then we got the panel discussion a little bit later. But anyway, we're ready to turn it back. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.